All right, this is number three in the uh, complete works of George Orwell, or at least his major works. Uh, this one is about his third book, Keep the Aspidistra Flying. This is a George Orwell book that almost nobody reads, or probably read. Orwell himself did not like it. He, at one point in a letter, suggested it just kind of fall out of print and be completely forgotten. He was not happy with it. And he it's a novel. He wrote it almost purely for money, which, uh, again, I think he said multiple times. His first two books did okay, um, but they, they certainly didn't provide him the income to live on. And this is around the time he had not yet uh, become a, a really sought-after writer of, of sort of magazine pieces and, uh, you know, getting income from working for newspapers and doing book reviews and things like that. That would come later. So he was having um, a rough time of it financially, and he took this contract for a novel, and he probably wrote it as quickly as he could and got it out the door so he could get his advance, because uh, it, it reads like that. Um, that being said, uh, it's it's not... It's not an awful book, and uh, it has themes that will recur, and it has uh, Orwell's good, well-formed prose and uh, other virtues that we will discuss. Uh, it is the story of a man named Gordon Comstock, who really seems like um, an author stand-in. He seems like someone that Orwell... It seems like Orwell at this point. Uh, he's a poet and a former uh, ad guy, like advertise. You know, he's kind of guy who'd like write jingles or write ad copy. Um, a job at, at which he was good, but left because he just couldn't stand it. Uh, it was just too too terrible. The general tension of the book is Gordon hates uh, what he has to do to make a living. Um, he hates the idea of making a living. He says multiple times in the book, he's at war with money. Um, he is against sort of the economic realities of his life. And this leads him to do some pretty... Uh, nothing extraordinarily nasty, but generally uh, become a kind of scummy, querulous person who isn't much good to anybody. Uh, the book begins with an excellent passage where he is a, a, a bookstore clerk. Everyone who's worked in a bookstore should read the start of Keep the Aspidist from Flying, because for about 20 pages, and Orwell, of course, did work at a bookstore for a while, for about 20 pages, um, it is a meticulous and uh, familiar uh, recreation of what it's like to work in a bookstore and what sort of customers you get, and what they're interested in, and how what they're interested in tells you about who they are, and it's it's pretty savage, it's pretty satirical, um, it establishes right away that Comstock is not someone who gets along well with other people, he's generally misanthropic, it's kind of part of his whole shtick of, of being against economic reality, he also can't bring himself to be, you know, just kind of a normal, courteous human being. Um, so he has this, you know, crappy, poorly paid job. He's kind of engaged in a project of how little can I live on, um, because I refuse to sell out. Uh, he'd been paid well as an ad guy, and he had met a woman there, and they are in a, some kind of relationship. There's no promise made, but it's, you know, reasonably serious. He has one friend who's in the well-off man um, who runs a literary magazine, a sort of leftist literary magazine, and, you know, helps Comstock uh, sell his poetry, which he does sell occasionally. Uh, he seems to be a, a reasonably good poet. Uh, sells not only in, in England, but in uh, the United States. But the main way that Comstock survives is he's a sponge. He's he is a sponge off the people around him. He, uh, he, you know, his his well-off friend takes him out to dinner, and pays the tab. Um, the woman who he has 
has been dating, uh, you know, pays for the cabs when they when they go. They'll take a cab out of town and go for a walk, and she pays for it. And this really upsets him because he thinks he should be, you know, able to do this himself. But he's too, you know, he can't afford it. Um, and he's mostly a sponge on his sister. He has a sister who takes care of their mother and has a an okay, not great job, and has basically spent years supporting him. When when worse comes to worse, he contacts her, he sends her a, a telegram or a visit, depending on what he's asking, and he just takes. He takes money off of her. Um, she's gotten so used to this because she has always seen him as like the kid, the promising kid who they need to support. Um, another one of the best passages in the book is when he knows this. Um, he knows this is wrong. He, he isn't devoid of conscience um, and he doesn't pretend like he deserves it. He knows this is wrong. But like a lot of people, uh, when he is shown the bad consequences of his behavior, when they are clear to him, his reaction is anger at the world that forces him to do this rather than altering the behavior. And there's a very good passage in the book that one wonders if perhaps is based on real experience uh, where or where the Comstock gets a surprise check from a magazine in America that buys one of his poems for what he sees as an absurd amount of money. And he determines, telling himself, the very first thing he's going to do is he's going to send some of it to his sister. You know, she's paid so much to him. He's got to send something back to her. But, you know, he, he, he doesn't have a stamp or something like that. And uh, there's other things to do with the money. And eventually, of course, he, even though he keeps reminding himself, send it to this, this, and this, he, he just doesn't. He doesn't send it. He fundamentally sees it as his money for his work. And she knows that in general she's uh, accepting. She's not going to put him on the grill. She's not going to stop supporting him if he doesn't send her this. Uh, it's a really good, well-written passage. Like, clear, again, you know, Orwell's prose is, is good. You know what's going on. Um, it When the failures of this book are, of, of writing are more about um, structure uh, of, of the book and uh, you know, maybe the occasional flutters of tone where things get too exaggerated or not enough or too quickly. It's, it's the kind of things that happen when the book is written really fast and probably delivered as a first draft. Uh, but they don't ruin the book. Uh, it still has a, a decent uh, arc to it. Um, but it's this tension between what he would like to do and how he would like to live and the economic realities of his life and the limits of his own generosity, which are which are not, it's not absent, he's not incapable of thinking about others or helping others, he just sacrifices it for the sake of this wider kvetch against the world. Uh, an aspidistra is a uh, houseplant. Uh, it is a common houseplant among, you know, sort of lower middle class households, and as Gordon walks around London he sees them in a lot of places, and he sort of imagines aspidistras as like a banner or a pennant uh, that people fly to show that they are a little, not just that you know they're they're a little bit middle class, but also that they have something in their life that matters beyond brute economic reality. Keeping an aspidistra alive is a tiny gesture, sort of like how you know, Orwell imagines jokes as a tiny gesture towards subversion. Aspidistras are these tiny little gestures towards aspiration. And even if everyone's doing the same one, and that sort of seems to cheapen it, um, it it's a symbol that keeps occurring, reoccurring to, to Gordon throughout the book, is people are, are trying. People are trying not to just be pure um, economic benefit, cost benefit analysis machines, um, because they have these, like, these little gestures towards uh, beauty, even if they are extremely standardized. Uh, so Gordon, uh, you know, eventually presses himself on just how determined he is, and he keeps living at a sort of lower level. He loses the job, or he takes a lower job. He just wants to, he wants to be free in a certain way by not, 
being asked to keep up any standard. He figures if he can learn how to live on nothing, then no one can make him do anything. And although this is, you know, futile and um, a, a sort of a enterprise with no point or clear ending, it's it's a very it's a familiar one. You can imagine people having it. I know people who have at least toyed with this style of thinking, which is um, rather than set your aspirations and, and live up to them and try to live up to a certain standard of living, why not set them down? And of course Orwell had experience of this um, in, in his efforts to sort of learn about poverty and to live among poverty, and so he may have been familiar there with the psychology of a character like this choosing voluntarily to live, you know, really, really um, cheaply and meanly. What pulls Gordon out of it is his relationship with uh, his his girlfriend. Uh, they are she she seems to see his um, choice to leave the ad company, even though he they, he has a more or less standing officer to return. They liked him and they they want him back if he'll have it. She sees this as sort of like a long adolescent rebellion, a sort of long kvetch, and finally some point late in the book it occurs to her that he might actually mean it that he might actually not ever go back to the ad company or any kind of middle class life and in that case what the hell is she doing because she you know she she's getting older and um she does want a family and sort of a re she's a, she's a reasonably um that's the way, a reasonably sophisticated woman of her time. She's in the workforce, but she is not at war with economic life and economic realities the way that Gordon is. They have a pretty good scene where they go on a long walk outside of London, and you know Gordon is upset with everything that's been done in the countryside and how ugly everything is, and they have a horrendous meal at a really, really fakey fakey condescending restaurant that makes Gordon really mad and he sort of keeps provoking the things that make him mad like he's enjoying it this is the tone of the book and it, it's 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 a little too one note all through the book perhaps there there might be part of the problem of the book is that Gordon enjoys being made angry and so he provokes interactions that will confirm his misanthropy and his decision to be at war with the common social life of his country. Um, it's sterile. Uh, it's it's a decision that doesn't go anywhere, but for now this is this is where he's at. His anger at the economic realities of his time does not channel into anything useful, like a determination to be a better person himself, or to you know organize or join groups that might change things, or to help others. It just he just sits and soaks in his resentment. And if you don't know anyone like that, or you've never been like that yourself, well done. Because it's a very real thing where, you know, the beginnings of a social conscience, the beginnings of a sense of the unfairness, overwhelm you. And they don't easily lead you anywhere, but you also can't get rid of them, so you just sort of enjoy poking that button in yourself that makes you upset and angry and you know mean and nasty and you find some people around you who at least agree with you but maybe they're not as addicted to this um, behavior as you are and they're putting up with you and they're hoping that you'll come out of it and that you know they're not saying you're wrong they're definitely not saying you're wrong but but they don't see the point of you just doing nothing with this and just living in a little hovel on sixpence a week and you know having like one shoes stuffed with newspaper and one hat and smoking cigarette ends that you find in the street uh, anyway uh, since it's a novel and needs to have some resolution you know if you wrote this book later and you just left off the resolution this would be a pretty convincing character portrait of how some people um, behave at a certain point in their life. But it is a novel, it has some resolution, where his girlfriend um, reveals to him that she's pregnant, and it's his child, and for the sake of the child, he 
decides to get going again and to stop his war on money. So he takes the job back at the ad firm and becomes clear, you know, he's like, we got to get an Aspidistra. Uh, so he's going to, you know, they will get married, they will raise the family for the sake of, the, of, of someone whose claims on him he can't reject. He does accept the claims of the child on him to be a, a support to them and not a, not a kvetching, loner, weirdo, eccentric, hateful poet. Uh, he accepts that he needs to help raise the child, so he will sacrifice his his sweet, sweet resentment at the money world and his sweet embrace of sticky, goopy poverty. He will sacrifice it, and he'll get a suit, and he'll have a marriage in a church. And if this starts to feel familiar, it, it should, because, of course, he's only delayed... Um, Hit the resolute the, the problems that this will require, and he hasn't really tested it. The child isn't even born when the book ends, because it's one thing to resolve to do this sort of thing, but then to face the actual years and years of it <coughs> is another. And it would be interesting to imagine a sequel where Gordon now has like a six-year-old, and maybe he's got another baby on the way, and he's done really well at the ad company. And you know, you can imagine this kind of novel much better from the '50s and the '60s. That sort of uh, the gray, uh, gray flannel suit type fiction about the unhappiness of the young executive, who, you know, revolutionary road. These kind of these young salary men who are on the corporate career track more or less because they were told to, and they're good at it or they aren't good at it, but they're not totally committed to it. They still have this touch and feel that maybe life is about more than you know, getting the corner office. Uh, Gordon Comstock is a little bit of a forerunner of guys like that. It's just that he happens to be living during a Great Depression <laughs> rather than a time of huge prosperity uh, where you could imagine someone, like, with buying a new fridge or putting in a new bush and then feeling really sad about it, like, oh, what is all this prosperity for, Janet? And Janet's like, oh, dear, I don't know, but... You know, surely there's something out there for us. There's something else that we could do. And instead, during a Great Depression, uh, Gordon is like, oh my gosh, is, can I possibly figure out how to live on sixpence a week? Uh, if they're going to take all the wealth from me, then damn it, I'm not going to give the pleasure of letting them know they've hurt me. Uh, certain themes that come up in other Orwell uh essays and books emerge here, um, the interest in the, in the literal, physical details of poverty will, will come up a lot in, in the next book that we'll talk about, his next major non, his major non-fiction work, uh, The Road to Wigan Pier, uh, that, that will come up, uh, the general attitude of, a, of an artist and their motives for making art, which he dissects really well in his uh, well-known essay, Why I Write. We'll talk about that at some point. And also, Orwell was really interested in what it meant to be English. He had traveled enough that he, and he was enough, he had enough of sort of a conservative background that was specifically trying to instill a sense of sort of patriotism and, and specialness about your origins that uh, he would have given this some serious thought. And he wrote a very interesting essay on it, which is uh, usually printed as England, My England. Um, some of that appears in Keep the Espedistra Flying, some of the little things that he begins to notice. And he's going to develop these themes into his work uh, as it continues. So not worth reading, not a waste of time, definitely not the novel that he probably hoped it could be. Um, and I hope that whatever money he made out of it was as helpful as he, uh, as he seems to have needed. Uh, so yeah, next, uh, The Road to Wigan Pier, uh, his second major work of nonfiction, and his first uh, to be very overtly political, uh, which of course became the hallmark of all his work. Bye-bye.